If you're excited to be here as I am, let's go ahead and get started by going to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you and thank you for this time you've given us, Lord. I thank you, Father, for your love, your mercy, Lord, and your grace. Father, you are an awesome God, Lord, and it truly is a privilege and an honor to serve you. And so, Father, we're men, Lord, and you know, you know us better than we know ourselves, Lord. And in a society, Lord, that we live in, Father, the, the, the men seem to have lost their way, Lord. And so, Father, I thank you for this men's rally, Lord, where we come together. We have an opportunity, Lord, to sharpen each other, to hold each other accountable, Lord, to grow in your word, Lord, to be the men of God that you called us to be. Father, the world was completely turned upside down by mere men who took your word seriously, lived it out, and challenged people to change and to repent and to follow you, Lord. And so, Father, you've certainly done it with just a handful of men. You can do it with with the men that are here tonight. So, Lord, I thank you for these men that are gathered here, Lord, from all these different churches, Father. We come to worship you, Lord, to hear from you, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of doing so. And, Father, we invoke your presence here tonight, Lord. And in a world and and a God who is omnipresent, Lord, it seems almost redundant to to invite you, Lord. But we do. We invite you here, Lord. We want to hear from you, Lord. We want to worship you, Lord. Will you meet us right where we're at? Father, we love you, and we praise you, Lord, and we thank you for this evening. I pray it be a blessing on each and every man that is here. Or it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everybody with the green bulletins, stand up for a second. Not you, Jason. You're Jason eliminated. Leonard, you're probably eliminated. I know Leonard. I go to church with Leonard. Between you guys, who has the new, the most recently born child? Me. What year was? Not you. That's a, um, that's the, what's the name of that title? I'm sorry. How God Makes Men. Her, How God Makes Men. John Plug from Man in the Mirror, it's a gentleman over here in the brown. He always gives us handouts. Their mission is to work with men all around the country. So if anybody's here is looking for advice, wants somebody to talk about men's ministry, our team here and John Plug's here. John Plug and I, <coughs> John Plug's a good resource that I use quite often. Somebody tell me something good that happened today. Something else I learned from the morning. Come on, guys. Every time I get in front of Christians, I say, somebody tell me something good that happened tonight. I always hear a room this quiet. We woke up. We woke up this morning. The yes. weather. The weather. <coughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. I got this to a lot of people, but that bullet. Amen. That's good. How many of us have kids in here? Somebody tell me something good that your kid did today. Yeah. You prayed with a co-worker this morning. Pray with a co-worker. Jason? Uh, we all had a church work day today. We have our grounds and all my boys were there. And they were really awesome. That's awesome. Took yes, down sir. Christmas lights. Hey, Amen. Yes. <laughs> hey, Amen. Yes, yes, sir. Daughter made it home safe from her friends. Stay there. That's awesome. Yes, sir. It's in line with her Okay. That's good. I learned, Warren, our speaker tonight, I've been taking classes with him for our associational office. He pointed out a verse to me that every time, almost every time I go up in front of people, everything good that happens is because of God. Amen. So, guys, let's not take the good things that happen to us just as chance. Oh, it happened yesterday, it'll happen tomorrow. Don't do that, guys. Good, good is all the time. So our next rally, or our next breakfast that we have, and I, ask, I want everybody's hand to go up. This is what good would happen to me. So, I, mean, I can share stuff. Normally, it's about my kids, the good things that are happening, or twin four-year-old boys. 
and I definitely keep my heart going, let me tell you. And guys, the kids know it, probably two at the same time that feed off each other, they're high, highly energetic boys. Um, some of you guys heard this before, which I, want, which I want to reiterate to the guys who are here for the first time. We're on the same, we're on the same team just playing on different fields, guys. It, Satan doesn't like us here tonight. How many of you agree with that? I tell my wife, rally week and breakfast week is horrible because Satan knows where to push the button. And I tell, okay, I know where she's going to push the button. She's not going to hit me. It comes a little bit with a curveball. I got a net time. But there's guys on my team that I can turn to in prayer when Satan can back me out that I want to rely on. But my whole job tonight is just to talk for a few minutes. I want to introduce one of our former team members. I want to ask Jason to come up here with me. Jason and I had the privilege, most of the time, guys, I stopped introducing guys on my team because they didn't like it. You know, it's not about us. Um, Jason stepped down last year from our team. Jason was probably, if not the first, one of the first men that came up and said that he would be committed to Northwest Indiana Men's Ministry. And I said, you know, I want to start recognizing our guys that are on our team when we go to, their, when we go to our different churches. And we came to Jason's church. He's the first one that I'm recognizing and giving a plaque. Jason and I probably have known each other 15, 18 years. We've set up chairs together at different churches. We've done different things. Jason's been an extreme encouragement to me. When I was <coughs> trying to figure out where God's taking you, Jason, with word alone, it's like God's got a plan for you, Ken. God's got a plan for you. And I was, we were back to me one time and I was behind the pulpit, and Jason's like, Ken, one day I'm going to preach behind that pulpit. Jason is one of those guys that you need who's just a straight encouragement. He, we worked on men's ministry before I came to Northwest Indiana the men's ministry. And when I told him about it, he's like, I'm on board. Whatever you need, I'm here for you. And I know today I can still pick up the phone and call Jason for a man who will come alongside me. So, Jason, I wanted to thank you. Just <laughs> because he doesn't come to our meetings doesn't mean I'm not going to bug him more often. And the second person I want to introduce is going to be the speaker. We started a couple rallies and breakfasts ago where we used to introduce the speaker, just to give you guys just a brief bio of what you guys are getting, because not everybody knows the speakers, and we used to do it right before he spoke. And we were one of them, I'm like, we're stopping the Holy Spirit. So I get up here now and give you guys a brief bio, I'm sure Warren's gonna tell you guys more about himself, but Warren is one of those guys who, who, who's been encouraging me, I've known him, he's been in the region for about six years, he came from Washington. He's married, he's one of the people that knows about children with twins, because he has a whole bunch of kids, and two of them are twins. Twins are an awesome breed. But Warren, Warren pushes me. One of the things, like I said, that I learned from Warren that I use almost every place I go up is to the homeless shelter. If it's meetings, if it's meetings like this, I'll even do it in my Sunday school class occasionally. What good things happen? Because anything good comes from God. And Warren's also been pushing us in our preaching class that we take. We have to share our faith with five different people. I don't know about you guys, but I started thinking, sharing my faith. So that means I had to actually share my faith with five different people. And my whole prayer, guys, if you're not sharing your faith, do it. I sat down one night and, and I wrote out and I wrote out my story just generally so I would know where I'm going. I like to know somewhat where I'm heading. And I got to share with one of my coworkers. I said, God, if you want me to share my faith, you're gonna have to put it in a non-threatening situation. And I was able to do it in our shop. We have people in and out for like five minutes while I was able to share my my story. Nobody came in and out of the shop and I have to do it with that. And I have one more person by Monday. I'm trying not to do it as I gotta do it for the class. I'm trying to do it to glorify God, so I'm, I'm praying that he gives me the right people to do it, but it's because of, of Warren. Um, Warren is a doctor. He, he, he's got all the college for that, and I, I asked him on Sunday, could we go to church together? I'm like, so how do you want me to introduce you at the thing? And he goes, Warren. <laughs> so Warren's a good guy. I'm sure there's some stories that, that he's going to share. There's some ministry that he shares with us. It's just uplifting. Monday nights for me, it's been personally challenging and growing this semester, so... Besides that, I'm turning it over from Pastor, to Pastor Mitch. We're just going to run through the Holy Spirit with us. Stay for food afterwards, and Mike's going to land the plane after everything's done. So thanks a lot for coming out, guys. Let's stand together as we sing. Yeah. 
Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Sing it out. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. So take me as you find me with all my fears and failures and fill my life again. Give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Sing, Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave shine your light shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory and King, Savior, He can move the mountains. Let me hear you sing. My God is mighty. Savior, Savior. Can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. I'll tell you what is Ken was sharing. I just think to myself, you know, it's so much easier to share your faith when you know all that God has done for you. When, God, when you think of how God saved you, he took you up out of that pit and he brought you to a place of holiness and justification before God. It makes it so much easier to share that great news with others. And I love this song. This song is called Before the Throne of God Above. We don't have the lyrics, but I'm going to try and help you and lead you as we sing it. But if none else... Just meditate on these lyrics as we sing this song. Before the throne. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong perfectly a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and pleads for me my name is graven on his hands my name is written on his heart i know that while in heaven he stands no tongue can bid me this depart no tongue can bid me then depart. When 
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my soul is long counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable i am the king of glory and of grace one with himself i cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with christ on high and christ my savior and my god with Christ my Savior and my God. We're going to sing one other one. This one's a little bit more popular. Uh, this is called Stronger. And once again, I apologize for not having the lyrics. But uh, God will work anyway. Stronger. There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. He broke my shame and sinfulness. He rose again victorious. Faithfulness can deny through the storm through the fire there is truth that sets me free Jesus Christ who lives in me you are stronger you are stronger sin is broken you have saved me it is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Sing that chorus. You are stronger, you are stronger, sin is broken, and you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. stronger you are stronger sin is broken and you have saved me it is written christ is risen jesus you are lord of all amen you may be seated Mitch, thank you. Let's give Mitch a hand. It is really good to be with you uh, this evening. I want you to open your Bibles with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I have something really important I want to share with you this evening. Uh, matter of fact, what I want to share with you, everyone here can relate to it in some way because someone... Um, helped you in the way that we're going to look at tonight, somewhere along the way. And it's usually not just one, usually it's multiple people. And so uh, what I want to talk about tonight is uh, this idea. Take spiritual responsibility for someone. 
take spiritual responsibility for someone. Let's say that together. Take spiritual responsibility for someone. All right, one more time. No, you're not there yet. Come on. One more time. Now, man, you need to sound like Braveheart out there. Let's go. You know, that's what you got to do. You got to rev this up a little bit. And so we need to understand that we're all here tonight because someone took spiritual responsibility for you. Someone took spiritual responsibility for me. You know, when I think about that, I think, you know, I don't have to think very long and hard about it. For me, primarily, it was a a 70-plus-year-old woman named Connie Roberts who had a little 12-year-old boy on her heart. And she called me up, and she said, I want you to go to church with me. I want you to go to Sunday school with me, and I'll fix you breakfast if you will. And I said, I'm in. You You had me at bacon and eggs, you know. And uh, that's kind of what it is. But over that table, she taught me the first memory verse I ever learned, and that was John 3.16, where God so loved the world. And I I remember I would be taking bites of eggs, and she would be saying, okay, say it after me. And I'd be like, you know, I was like just a hungry little kid. You know, that verse has served me uh, since the time I was 12 years old until today. It's a reminder. And I am so grateful for Connie in her investment in me. Um, You have that opportunity tonight to take spiritual responsibility for someone else. And um, you are their hope. I am their hope. You know, in uh, Colossians, uh, it says this, Christ living in you, the hope of glory. That's an amazing passage, isn't it? Christ living in you, the hope of glory. All right. John chapter um, 1, starting, I'm going to start reading in verse uh, 43. And in verse 43, of course, Jesus is getting going here. And he says in verse 43, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. The first thing that I want to point out to you in the text is that Jesus took the initiative to go. Uh, It wasn't that he was hoping that it would turn out that way. But he actually uh, found Philip. He took the initiative to find him. And he said, follow me. Did you know that that's really the hallmark of a disciple? Uh, Follow me. But it's hard to have somebody follow you if you don't take the initiative in their life. Uh, We had a a young lady at our house um, Thursday evening. Her name is Hallie. And she works at a coffee shop that that I go to just about every morning because I don't Any coffee drinkers out here? Mm-hmm. Y'all supposed to say amen, right? Amen. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, <clears throat> y'all might need some coffee before we get started. But uh, anyway, Hallie was at our house, and, and uh, she, is, she is a professing believer, but she is way away, really, from walking with Jesus. And we, we have been building this relationship with her. She sent me a text about two weeks ago. We were trying to get her to come to church, and, and she said, you know what? In her text, I've got it on my phone right now. She said, can I be honest with you? Going to church is scary. And this was on a Sunday night when she was supposed to come, and she said this. She said, but can I still come over to your house? And she brought a friend over, and she's brought two or three of her coworkers over to our house. And so Thursday night, we said, uh, I went to her, uh, prior to that, about like Monday, and I said, hey, if uh, going to church with you is a scary thing, hey, would you come over to the house and uh, for a Bible study? And she said, 100% yes. No, 10,000% yes, I will go, I will come to the house. And so we, we sat around, we sat around the, the table with my family, and we discussed a verse like this. It says this in Jude, Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained with uh, corrupted flesh. Then listen to this. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault 
and with great joy. You know, that is our hope, is that, listen, we can't be good enough to get this done. The reality of our salvation is summed up in, in really the name Jesus Christ. He is able to present us without fault and with great joy. That's what that day will look like. If you want to know what that day is going to look like, you want to see it from his perspective, he's going to say, here's my son, Father. This is the one belongs to me. And he's going to bring us up there, and he's going to set us before God without fault and with great joy. I don't know about you, but man, he's awesome. Jesus Christ is awesome. And so, as we look at this text, I want, I want us to understand how vitally important it is for us to begin to take spiritual responsibility for someone else. And I want you to understand that it's, it's not just about you um, saying hello to them, but that's where it starts. You need to be the first to say hello. That's what initiating means. And so when you see someone, and uh, be, you can just simply get into that conversation, uh, ease into the water, and say, how are you doing today? Have you enjoyed the sunshine? You know, and you can move from there, and everybody's like, yeah, man, I'm tired of this crazy winter and all that kind of stuff. And listen, it doesn't take hardly anything to get into a conversation. And so, but here's the deal. You will never get into a spiritual conversation if you do not take the initiative to go out there and do it. You won't, it, you'll pass them by. You'll pass them by one after uh, another. And so I just want to point out, you're going to take responsibility when you take the initiative in life of someone else. Um, I don't know if Dennis is here tonight, but uh, Dennis and I uh, went out in a neighborhood not really too far from here, and uh, we went knocking on doors. And the way that I go and, and I go and, and engage people is I don't go and engage them to get them to come to church. I go and engage them really to just pray for them because I believe that God really does love them where they're at and I want to be in a place where I could just be a blessing to them and I remember I went out with Dennis Starkey and, and who's a, a member of this church you may, um, you may or may not know him but anyway me and Dennis went out and we met the first guy that we talked to his name was Rico and I just said Rico is there anyone any way that we could pray for you he said yeah I need a job man I need to provide for my family I said well, let's pray. And so we prayed with Rico right there on his front porch. He lived right across the street from the church. Just right across the street. We went about three doors down, and, and uh, there was uh, this really big um, black man that was putting his wife in the car. And, um, um, you know, it's kind of one of those odd situations. And so he comes up and he says, Hey, what do you guys want? What are y'all doing? And I was like, well, you know, we're, we're just really out um, wanting to be an encouragement to people. We know that God loves people. He loves you. He loves your family. And really what we want to do is to know this. Is there, can we pray for you? And he said, sure, you can pray for me. And so I'll never forget it. The, me and Dennis and this big guy are in his front yard, literally three men holding hands. I mean, I'm like, I'm not sure how manly that is. But anyway, that's what we were doing. And we prayed, and I'm telling you, I asked Jesus to watch over him, protect him, provide for him, and make himself known to him. And I, everything good I can think of that would help them consider Jesus Christ, I pray for. And then I said, Amen, and we look up, and, he's, and uh, what you don't know, because I didn't tell you, is his name was Muhammad. And he had a um, medallion uh, that he was wearing, and it was the, the, the moon and the star, which means he's Muslim. And so after we were done praying and uh, his wife and kids are in the car watching all this, you know, unfold. And I'm like, this has got to be a, a really funny looking thing, you know. And he, he grabs me by the shoulders like this, you know. And I'm like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. He said, this is how we do it. And he hugs me here. And he hugs me here. And I'm like, please don't kiss me, man. You know, I'm not ready for that. And so then uh, um, he said, thank you. And he got in the car and man... What I, I recognize a, a lot of different things. One, I recognize I would never have made a connection with Muhammad had we never went out. Had we not ever took the initiative. If our eyes wouldn't have been intentional. You know, all of those things go together. 
And uh, man, it, what, a, what a great blessing. I watched Jesus Christ just sweep away all the barriers in moments. There, it wasn't about his background, his race, his economic place, his education stuff. It wasn't about any of that. As soon as we bowed and prayed to Jesus Christ, all of that was swept away. Jesus Christ is able to do far more than you and I will believe Him for. If we're not taking the initiative, then how much could we possibly be believing Him for? Think about it. How much could we possibly be believing? If we won't walk across the room, if we won't walk across the street and say, you know what, I've lived by you for 13 years. And you know what, I don't know your name. I want to know you. How many of you know your neighbors by name? I, uh, a friend of mine, his name is Carl, and uh, when, I, when we go out and we start engaging people, uh, I, I asked Carl, I said, Carl, how many uh, neighbors do you know by name? He said, ah, probably about six, seven, you know. And uh, I think what got me thinking about this is we had prayed with one of his neighbors before, and uh, we had a group of, of students from the school, and we were all out in his neighborhood praying for people. And I said, Carl, how long have you lived in your neighborhood? And he said, 29 years. Now, I want you to let that sink in. Is it possible to live as a Christian 29 years in your same neighborhood and only know five, six of your neighbors by name? Absolutely, it's possible because it's the reality in which we live today. We don't even talk to our neighbors anymore. Uh, maybe we'll wave at them, you know, occasionally. Uh, or uh, say, you know, man, your dog got out, you know, you know, find something to gripe about. But I challenged him. I said, Carl, I said, uh, you know, why don't you go out and start shepherding your community? Why don't you take the initiative and go out and just start praying for your neighbors, praying with them? And he said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> After four weeks... You know how many of the, his neighbors that he knew by name and knew how to pray for them? Forty. Twenty-nine years of being unintentional. Five or six. You have to. You can almost just run them over. You know. <laughs> you know. That's about how you get to meet them. You know. Four weeks of being intentional. He knows forty of them. Not only does he know their name, but he's knowing how to pray for them. He has taken the initiative in their life, men. People need you to take the initiative. Listen, look. This is what Jesus did. It says, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. He took the initiative. Now that's not where, that's not the only place you see that. If you follow down in the text, look at verse 44. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel. So Jesus found Philip. And then Philip found who? Everybody say Nathaniel. Nathaniel. That way I know that you're alive and, and you're with me, all right? So he went and found Nathaniel. That means that, hey, he found, Jesus found him. And then he's like, hey, you know what? This is too good to keep to myself. I'm going to go over to my friend Nathaniel because Nathaniel needs to follow Jesus too. He needs to follow him. If we're going to take spiritual responsibility for people, we need to take the initiative to go and find them. And I want to share this with you. They're all around us all the time. You can't go anywhere where you can't find somebody who needs to be walking with Jesus. Think about it like this. How many people in your family right now that you know are not walking with Jesus that you would love to see them walking with Jesus? How many relatives do you have that are not currently walking with Jesus that you would love to see walking with Jesus? How many people do you know at work that are not walking with Jesus that you would love to see walking with Jesus? 
When I was driving up here tonight, I was thinking about Bob Letke and Kenny Gamblin. Kenny Gamblin, um, longtime pastor in our association, he probably pastored for, at the same church in Valparaiso for 30 something years, 37 years, a long time. Well, he used to work at the mill, and Bruce Eisen won him to the Lord, another pastor in the association where uh, uh, Jeff has, uh, I guess Bruce started the church that Jeff is pastoring. But anyway, uh, Bruce led Kenny Gamblin to the Lord, and Kenny Gamblin on, on his drives to the mill witnessed to uh, one of his co-workers named Bob Letke. Now Bob Letke is the pastor of Valpo Baptist Church where Kenny Gamblin has been a longtime member and pastor for years. Because Kenny Gamblin took spiritual uh, responsibility for Bob Letke. First of all, let's introduce you to Jesus. And then let's get you growing so that you can do great things. That's how that works. We've got to take the initiative for sure. And then it says that, that Philip took the initiative and he went and found Nathaniel and he told him, hey, we have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. What did he tell him? He, tell, he told him what he knew. You'll notice that it's pretty short. He didn't go into any long, lengthy discourse about all the stuff that he knew. He said, you know what? All I can tell you is we found him. We found him. He is everything that the Bible says he is. I want to tell you, he is. You know what that looks like for me today? You know, I, um, my wife and I will celebrate 19 years of marriage this June. And uh, we've had a great life together. You know, and I think about that, and I, I genuinely appreciate the relationship that I have um, most of the time. You know, just why, the reason I say most of the time is because this morning when we were going in to have our cup of coffee, the, the little barista said to my wife, wow, you look amazing, you look great, just like, you look like a teenager. And then she looks at me and says, you, you need just for men. You, know, you need some Grecian formula or something. What? You know? And I was like, okay, that's enough there. But anyway, so most of the time I really, I really like that. But uh, anyway, um, we need to take the initiative. We need to go find people um, and then invest in them. This, how does it work? It works through a series of invitations. Go back and look what Philip actually did. It says, if you'll notice, that he went and found him, which means that he took the initiative, right? He went and found him. Initiate. And then it says that he told him, hey, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. And then you'll notice in verse 46, Nathaniel responds, Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth, he asked. Don't be alarmed when somebody says, you know, whatever you're doing is a joke. Because often um, it's a response of insecurity. You know, let me, let me uh, lay you in on a little secret. We often criticize what we are insecure about. Have you picked up on that yet in life? We often criticize what we are insecure about. And so Nathaniel says something critical about what Philip talked about. I think that's to guard our own insecurities at times. But he goes on to say, um, anything good? Let me catch up here. And he says this, come and see. Come and see. There's the invitation. What did Jesus say? Come and follow me. Um, we give a series of invitations. That's our job. That is our job. That is how we spiritually invest. So this is what it actually looks like. You take the initiative in someone's life to say hello, to begin that rapport, that kind of stuff, and then you give a series of invitations that get them to consider who Jesus is. Hey, come to my house. We're going to have a little get-together. It's a great way to get to know your neighbors, and we're going to study the Bible. We're going to get to know a little bit more about who Jesus is. Love for you to be there. Um, is it? It's really interesting our culture is today, our Christian culture. Uh, if I were to ask you a question, when's the last time you intentionally had a lost person in your home to share uh, the gospel and get them closer to Jesus? How long has it been? 
Has it ever happened? Listen, guys, you, this is doable. You know, get a pizza. You don't even have to make it, you know. You can just buy it and <laughs> stick it in the oven and say, come on over, we're having pizza, we're going to talk about Jesus. It doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be complex. But it's not going to happen unless you take the initiative and you start giving invitations. You start, um, how many of you eat lunch at the same place every week? Any, anybody out here? Got one or two? couple willing to admit it right okay so you're like well I don't know you might show up I want to know that way I can show up and have free lunch but other than that um, if you're going to be there anyway then use that as an opportunity talk to people about Jesus say hey I'm going to be you know Wendy's up here you know Wednesday at, at noon hey if you want to come join me I'd love to talk with you all we can do is give invitations and then there's going to be some that take that invitation and they're going to want to know what you have. They don't know who it is. They just know that you're a little bit different. And they're going to, they're going to want to have that, that, that uh, interaction with you. But you'll never do it if you don't give an invitation. Hey, come over to the house. If you don't believe me, try something like this. Go out and give invitations to your neighbors. And say, listen, we're going to have a Bible study over my house. And uh, love for you guys to come. We did that in, a, in our new neighborhood, and guess what? Some of our neighbors actually had the audacity to show up. You know, I couldn't believe it. And you know what they said afterwards? They said, you know what? This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And when one of our neighbors had a, a, a serious thing happen in their life, you know what they did? They came knocking on our door. They said, you know what? I'm having a hard time dealing with this. And we stayed up until midnight, and we prayed with them. We encouraged them from the scripture. You know what? A lot of this doesn't happen because we never take the initiative, and we never give the invitation. Most of what needs to happen about taking spiritual responsibility for people can happen through taking the initiative and giving a series of invitations. Let's look what else happens here. It says that, that when Jesus saw uh, Nathanael approaching in verse 47, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom nothing is false. How do you know me? See, what the people in your life that God has in place for you to, to impact, they don't know that Jesus already knows them. They're like Nathanael here. They don't know that Jesus already knows them. They think that they're doing this life by themselves, and they're not. Jesus already knows about all their troubles and everything that they're going through. He's not surprised by anything. And what they need to know is that he knows them. He knows them. That's what they need to know. And then th this is what he says. How do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, this is prior to the, the conversation that Philip had with him. And I don't know exactly what it is that he knew about this situation. But he knew, and by the words, he knew that only Nathaniel knew it. There are probably only two people that knew what was going on here, and that's Nathaniel and Jesus. And so he says, I saw you under the fig tr tree before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Often, you know, anything that you could say about a text like this would be speculative. You know, it really would be. It'd be speculation. But all I can tell you is that Jesus Christ knew where Nathanael was, and he was able to make a connection with him so that Nathanael would know who he was too. And see, all we're trying to do is just get people and Jesus together. <laughs> you know, we're not trying to get people to like us. We're trying to get people to love Jesus. We're trying to get people to look to Jesus, to walk with Jesus, to consider how good Jesus is. And if all they do is like us, we have, we have way uh, shorted them. We've got to get them looking to Jesus, and we can, we, we've got a good way of doing it. 
He models it. He took the initiative. He gave invitations. Jesus said, come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you that. And so look what happens. I think if you can remember to, if, uh, to take spiritual responsibility by initiating action, by giving invitations, and by making investments in the lives of others. Jesus said this, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than this. And then I, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You know, I often wondered if, if this was one of the guys that, that uh, opens up the book of Acts where they take Jesus and he's, he's uh, ascending. But I don't know that for sure. And again, it would be speculation. But one, one of the things that I do know for sure is that Jesus says you're going to see and experience more. And in order to see and experience more, there has to be some sort of investment. There has to be a significant investment in the life of someone. And so when I, when I track this out, if you and I are going to take spiritual responsibility for someone, then we need to be the first to say hello. We need to be looking for opportunities. We need to be giving invitations. Hey, come with me. Come join my family. Hey, come. Hey, guys from the church are getting together. This is what we're going to be doing. You know, we'd love for you to come along. You know, I was at the home of uh, 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 a member from a, another church. This was just a couple weeks ago. And you know how he, now he's like a, uh, I don't know if he, uh, he may be, I'm not sure if he's a deacon, but he is a, he's one of the guys in the church that you can, you can just trust. You know, he, he and his wife are involved. There's all kinds of stuff going on. But you know how that, that they got into church? Is that a group of men from church, um, he, his garage door was broken down. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? His garage door was broken down. And his neighbor, who was a member of this men's group, uh, left that morning and noticed that his garage door was broken down. And then they went to this, this men's group on, on uh, that morning, had breakfast, and then a group of them said, hey, we can go and help him. And so they just go and, and uh, knock on this door. And he's like, what's going on here? He's like, we've come to help you with your garage door. He's like, no way. Now he is a faithful member of that church today. You know, I think that's what it looks like to be salt and light so that people need to taste and see how good God is. They won't taste and see how good God is if they can't taste and see him through you and me. And so we need to be in a place to do that. Take spiritual responsibility for someone. I want to share a passage with you. The way that I do this, uh, you know, I, I just write their name on my hand. So I meet somebody for the first time. And I'll just write their name on my hand. met a Pedro in uh, Nashville who's a Scientologist. And uh, he came and said, you know, he's trying to get his spill out. And I said, just give me the bottom line. Give me the bottom line. Uh, and I said, no, that's not it. I said, that is, the, that's, that is the hook, not the fish. Give me what you're really selling. And then he mentioned Dianetics, and I knew where he was at. And so... Uh, I said, you know, I don't have to be hooked up to a machine to, uh, to have uh, joy. You know, all we need to do is get hooked up to Jesus Christ. And I said, what I've found in my personal life is that Jesus Christ has become uh, everything that I've ever needed. And I said, you know, if uh, he can do the same for everybody who calls on his name. And I just want to encourage you, you know, to consider him today. You need to remember their name. How are you going to remember their name? I think that's the key to ministry, is getting to know them by name. And here's what I found personally. If you will write their name down, either on your hand or a sheet of paper, whatever, and uh, you will pray for them by name for a few days, you will not forget their name. And then God will begin to open doors for that relationship to, to go to other levels. 
So this is a passage I want you to think about. It comes from Isaiah 49. And uh, it's talking about the restoration of Israel. It's talking about things being renewed and uh, regained. And uh, there's some great verses in here. Like uh, in uh, 49 it says, uh, verse 6, The Lord says, It is too small a thing for you, for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring about the house of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so Jesus is saying, I'm not just for you, I'm for everyone. And I don't know that we've really not caught that in our day and time too. You know what? The truth is that Jesus loves you, but he also loves every other person you walk by. He, he loves every person that does stuff you don't like, says things that you don't care about, thinks in ways that you, you could care less about. Jesus Christ loves every person that you walk by every day. And that's why he died on the cross. How do we know that's true? Listen to what he says. This, is, this comes from uh, verse 15 and 16. Can a mother forget her baby while it's nursing and have no compassion on the child that she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls will ever be before me. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. He knows where you're at. And I, I just want to make this as practical as possible. There's people that you need to get to know their name. And that's going to be the first step for you. Maybe you work by them. Maybe you live across the street from them. Maybe you see them every day in the restaurant or the, the coffee shop and you just don't know who they are. Get to know their name. And then I, what I'm going to ask you to do is pray for them and begin to give invitations and make investments in their life. Find ways to make investments in them. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you today. God, I thank you for these men. And I pray your blessings upon their life. And I pray, Father, that you would take us, Lord, and help us to take spiritual responsibility for our families, uh, for the people that we work with, for our relatives, Lord, for our co-workers and, and for our neighbors. And Lord, there's many people along the way that you bring to our attention. And God, I pray that, that we wouldn't go a day without inviting or investing or taking the initiative in some way to help somebody get in a better relationship with you. God, I just thank you for these men here tonight. God, I know that you can do great things through just a handful. And Father, I just thank you for these men. And I pray, Father, for I believe you for great things. I believe that you can do so much more than we ask or imagine. And so, God, we pray that you would do it in these lives here represented tonight. Do more than what, what they can see right now and what they expect. Raise their expectation. God, that they would believe you for great things. They would believe you enough that they would say hello and, and begin to take those initiatives. And God, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come before you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? If God has brought somebody to your heart, this is what I would like you to do. I would just uh, like you to pray for them right now. You may not even know their name, but you encounter them all the time. I want you to pray for them. Lord, help that clerk that I walk by almost every day. That person I sit next to in class. Help them. And then make a commitment to get to know them by name. Think about ways that you can invite them to be a part of what God's doing. You know, maybe that first invitation is, hey, would you and your family come to church with me and my family? Would y'all have dinner with us afterwards? You know what I find a lot of times is that people wait on an invitation. The ministry waits on an invitation that you and I have not given. And we have not given. And so, we come to places like this. 
reminded that, that God still does great things in the lives of people. And this world needs to encounter a great God through you and me. So would you pray for them tonight? Pray for them by name or by face. And just ask the Lord, show me how I can invest in them so that they will love you. Show me how I can invest in them so that they will love you. Show me, Lord, how I can invest in them so that they will love you. The scripture says that there'll be a day when they'll welcome you in. They'll welcome you in. You can pray where you are. You can come down. If there's any decisions that you have to make personally, you can make it right. God's here. And so let's just spend a moment while Mitch leads us, either in a song or just plays. Let's just make it right. Let's begin to get invested and involved in the lives of the people that God has it for us.